Cube. At Big Data SV 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsors WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. And Actian, accelerating Big Data 2.0. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in uh, Silicon Valley for Big Data SV event. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE, and we are covering all the action in Big Data, the Strata Conference, innovation, entrepreneurs, startups, growing companies, VCs, we have them all here inside theCUBE. theCUBE is our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org, and John Santa Ferraro is here, uh, product marketing, Actian. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Ah, thanks, glad to be here. So, uh, big data is uh, growing like crazy, valuations are good, we've been talking about you know, the emerging companies, and some of the upstarts that are trying to get a position here, a lot of new names in the Pavilion Strata Conference. Um, so my first question is, you're in product marketing, so you have to look at the market, and you also understand what's going on, on the engineering side of things. You guys have a nice platform play that you guys are putting together and growing on. So I got to ask you, what is this big data movement of 1.0 to 2.0? Let's discuss this next chapter. We are transitioning to big data is growing up. Yeah, it's, it's definitely growing up, and I think there's a number of things in the marketplace in general, the, the global marketplace, that are driving it. So when you think about it, we, we all know that the world has changed and everything is now digital, everything is either a pixel or a byte of some kind. Uh, there's trillions of you know, events being captured every single day, there's social data being poured into the world. Um, so everything, everything is digital. So we know the world has changed. Um, what's striking is that the world is going to continue to change at an ever-increasing pace. And so when you think of the rate of change, the way things are moving now, um, it used to be that you could transform yourself as a company every five or 10 years, and now you have to transform continuously. You have to innovate constantly to be able to keep up with the speed of change. So the only thing that we know to be constant is change itself. And that, so as a, as a result of that, you get, you get all that speed, time becomes the new gold standard. So time is the one thing that you can't get more of. You can only use it more wisely uh, or speed things up. And so there's this need to innovate constantly, to be able to uh, transform yourself over and over again, and to be able to do it at ever-increasing speed. And so that's what's driving this shift from big data 1.0, where, where things sort of sat in a big data reservoir, and to big data 2.0, where there's this need to operationalize big data and push it towards that, that real-time interaction. Time is money. I mean, time is the new, new scarce resource, right? And that's what you're saying. So is that, is that big data 2.0? I mean, I remember back when Dave was asking about web 2.0 earlier when we were doing an um, interview on CrowdChat. Um, and web 2.0 is always the elusive. What does that mean? So what does, in your definition, what is big data 2.0. Yeah, I mean, it, it rolls out of big data 1.0, right? So if you go, if, if we go back and look at what's happened to date, uh, big data 1.0 has had some great accomplishments. So um, obviously we've proven that you, can, that you can store massive amounts of data affordably and you can scale that to no end. Um, we, uh, as a result of that, all of these companies have captured these massive amounts of data uh, regardless of whether they believe it has value or not. It used to be you had to establish value and then you could keep the data. Now you just keep it all. Um, and then there's, there's this uh, consensus, I think, that as, as all of this data has, has poured into the data reservoir, companies um, have naturally begun to do data discovery, trying to figure out what's in there. It's commonplace to be doing data discovery. It's commonplace to, uh, for companies to start doing data services and data provisioning out of that reservoir. Where does the data need to go? What needs to happen to it? What does it look like? Um, and then the, the consensus around that whole big data 1.0 movement was that we have, a lot of, we have a lot of data and analytics is going to be the key to unlocking the value in that data. So big data 2.0 is about making that shift to the point where we now take these, these big data projects that are stuck in the lab and move them into production. It's about increasing the time to value, figuring out what value there is, increasing the time to value, and then, and then being able to, uh, to operationalize the big data and use analytics to take the understanding of what you have there and, and embed it in business processes, to move it towards real-time operational engines, to, uh, to, to be, take these you know, very sophisticated and complex analytic models 
and use that to provide intelligence into the streaming analytic systems that, you know, I always, I, I look at it this way, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of talk about streaming analytics. And because of the nature of physics, streaming analytics will never be smarter than about third grade. Um, so what thir that third grade streaming analytics needs is they need the PhD from the heavy lifting analytics models that are being crunched you know, by these, by these uh, you know, relational analytical systems to be able to feed that PhD level intelligence into the third grade system and bring it into real time. We a TV show, how to beat the third grader, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> had the PH, had the make PhD it, against the third grader. make it kindergarten? So, I, <laughs> so, so John, what was the good of, of 1.0 and what was the not so good? Um, you know, the good uh, I just described. So the, the, the good was massive, massive scale at affordable cost. It was capturing all the data. It's learning to do data discovery and data provisioning. Uh, it's, it's this realization that analytics is going to unlock it. Um, the challenge was is that, that, that people hit the wall in certain areas, and, and there's some challenges that are people, people are facing in Big Data 1.0 that keep those projects locked in the lab. Um, so for one, there's the, some of the complexity of putting together a Big Data system. A lot of it is still open source. The open source is always changing. Um, there really is pieces, parts that you have to put together to, to build a big data system today. Um, the second is just the complexity all of, of all the new data. What do I do with these new kinds of data? How do I bring it in? How do I parse it? What do I need to do to be able to run analytics against it? Um, and then skill set shortages as a result of that, right? So there's a shortage of skill set in terms of the number of people that can do Java programming and Python programming, um, that know how to know and understand how to use MapReduce, um, a shortage of all the data science skills that are needed to abstract the the value out of that data, uh, and then there's some enterprise challenges. You know, there's challenges around high availability, security, things like that, um, and so so these challenges combined are the kinds of things that have kept. Uh, folks, in th those those big data projects in the lab and kind of stuck in big data 1.0. Yeah, and and the other byproduct of that is unclear ROI for a lot of companies. Um, now, having said that, I was listening to John's interview uh, with with John Schroeder from FR, and it was interesting, John, to hear him just talk about the number of companies that are really doing substantive work. And so, it's interesting to note when you talk to the broad audience. I would still say most people don't really understand, most organizations don't know where they're going to get ROI from big data broadly, yet there's pockets that are crushing it, right? And so now 2.0 comes along and presumably what that's going to do is, you know, it's the diffusion of technology or adoption, right? So, um, so what are the sort of new technical you know, parameters, requirements, architectural you know, innovations of 2.0 that we should be paying attention to? So, so in 2.0, the thing that is going to unlock that value of you know, the project stuck in the lab uh, is going to be the, the, the new technologies that are emerging now that do a number of things. One, they, they really need to abstract away the complexity of, of what lies underneath the system. What, where is the data stored? How do you access it? What kind of programs do you need to write? Um, second, it's got to be accessible to the masses. So, um, not everybody's going to grow up to be a data scientist. Um, there's going to be a shortage. And so, so these new technologies have to provide ways for the business analyst to be able to, um, to get at the massive amount of data there without having to be a programmer. They have to provide ways for them to use analytic functions without having to be a data scientist. Um, they have to be able to provide accessibility uh, not just to the, the big data platform and the massive data reservoir itself, but to the kinds of platforms that can crunch these analytics to drive business value. Um, you know, so one is abstracting away complexity. Two, accessibility for the masses. Um, third, it, it's, it's got to be performant. It's got to be higher performant. The other sort of challenge that I, that I didn't mention is some of the performance challenges of a batch-oriented uh, file system that, that can't crunch through massive algorithms at the kind of speed that companies need to crunch through. And so, so the, you know, the ability to have this high performance access uh, to, to be able to process that data at increasing speeds. And then the last one, I think, is this ability to combine relational and non-relational. So the, the, uh, you guys were at uh, Strata in New York a few months back, and you remember Ken Rudin from Facebook got on stage, and his first slide said, big data does not equal Hadoop. Mm -hmm. 
and everybody sort of gasped, right? And his second slide said big data equals Hadoop plus relational. And so here is a, a company that, you know, that was on the forefront of creating Hadoop and they've hired Ken Rudin because he's an analytics expert and he understands relational and he can bring in that high performance analytic processing that they need to be able to do some things that they couldn't do on the Hadoop platform. So it, it, the, the other thing, it's got, it, you know, there's this, this combining of, of relational and non-relational technologies um, in, a, in a way that abstracts that complexity away from the end user. So it, it all becomes much more usable so that, uh, you know, today a lot of these, a lot of the companies that have figured out, they, they, were able to, they were able to go out and find the resources to write all the programs. They were able to find the data scientists to do the heavy lifting work. Well, we're running out of those people. And so in Big Data 2.0, to make this available to the mass, masses, we have to industrialize it and make it simple for more people to get access let's to the data. Let's talk about that, because one of the things we always talk about at our Big Data NYC event in New York City with Strata uh, was there, you mentioned that. The big trend was um, data simplification, because the knowledge worker now is basically an analyst, soon to be casual user. And I think the, the, the trend is, what you're saying is vectoring down the road of Stuff just happens under the hood. Magic happens, you know, automagically, as they say. So, so that we're not there yet, but we're getting there. So, so talk about that trend and what has to happen to get there. Well, the good news is we actually are there, uh, in in part, right? It's, so, not we haven't Who, simplified you, you guys or the everything. industry. Uh, Actian. So, the okay. the Actian analytics platform um, gives you the ability to choose from uh, hundreds of operators. Uh, that, that sit in a visual framework. So you can literally be a business analyst and drag and drop the, the pieces and put them together into a, into a data flow or a, a workflow. Um, and without writing any code, without having to understand MapReduce or how a Hadoop cluster is put together and where the data is distributed, um, our platform will literally just go figure out where the data is, what resources are available, and send the workload down to the HDFS cluster right on the node where you get the best performance and bring the results back. So no Java, no Python, no MapReduce. You literally just use drag and drop operators and all the work is done on the HDFS node. So that's, that's exactly the direction we're going. Okay, so that's, so you've got the abstracting complexity and just address some of that. I want to come back to uh, accessible to the masses because we haven't talked about it much this week, John, but the, at other sort of big data events that we've done, we've talked about making analytics accessible to the business user. You know, you pointed out, John, not everybody has a data scientist, there's a big, big shortage of data science skills. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Part of that is visualization. You know, we've done conferences at like, for instance, Tableau, and you know, they talk about the viz, and a lot of business users, not a lot of geeks, you know, in, in that audience. A lot of geeks, but they're not tech, IT technology geeks, they're more sort of data geeks, right? Yeah. Uh, and visualization geeks. So, th so visualization, visualization is part of that, but I wonder if we could unpack that a little bit more in terms of, uh, of, of analytics for the masses or big data for the masses. Um, is that really happening? What has to you know, take place? How is Actian supporting that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. I think that, that there's an, part of it is an educational piece that has to take place, and part of it is technology that allows the, the business user to do that, right? So the, that drag and drop interface that I talked about uh, includes not just transformational kinds of things, but machine learning algorithms and, and text analytics and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, in our high performance engine, we embed uh, over 500 analytic functions right in the database. And so all you have to do is call it and attach it to some data and it runs at a highly performance speed. And so our task as Actian is to go out to our customers and our prospects and to the broad community and start educating them about Analytics 101. So these business analysts, by nature of who they are, uh, a lot of them have, you know, have some kind of a mathematics background, they have MBAs, they understand statistics. So they don't have to become a data scientist who creates and writes algorithms. They just have to understand what the algorithm is and how you use it against the data. And so we're looking at rolling out an education program that says, you know, here is a, you know, we could take them deep into k-means cluster algorithms, but why not give them a simple pattern match algorithm and let them apply it to the data and tell them how to use it? Um, we, uh, we did this, we went and sat with a customer, it was a retail customer, 
Um, it was a business analyst. He had never done any kind of an, you know significant analytics. We plugged in this this al, you know this this very simple pattern matching algorithm that runs in our database, and with th we sat there for 30 minutes, looked at real data, and within that 30 minutes, we started to uncover fraud in their stores. And so, in a 30-minute time period, that business analyst started to learn how to use the analytic function. He'll probably never uh, never write. Uh, a, a matching algorithm of some kind, but Analytics 101 is about helping people understand how to use the algorithm, not just uh, not have to be able to create them. And then let's talk about performance. So you, you're seeing innovations like Spark and, and Yarn. Um, is is that sort of what you're referring to? Are there other Uber trends that are facilitating better performance in 2.0? Yeah, I mean, I think Spark and, and Yarn are absolutely on the horizon. It, memory is where it's at. And I, I, I divide the market into two different categories when you look at memory. So there's uh, a number of old vendors who are taking their old technology and trying to shove it into memory, and it runs a little bit faster. Um, and then there's the, the next generation vendors who understand that, that it's all about putting things in memory. And we've actually created software that takes full advantage of that memory and optimizes, in fact, to run things in memory. So one of our customers currently, um, for the Actian Analytics platform, has a, a fi is running 50 terabytes in memory. And they've got uh, 50,000 customer attributes that they track. They have 10,000 customer segments, so they're doing hyper-segmentation, and they're recalculating that massive analytic 20 times a day. And then they feed it into their ad optimization engine so that they can, so that again, that's the the PhD is the heavy lifting, hyper segmentation. The they're given that PhD understanding to their their three year uh, third grade, um, third grade operational ad optimization system, and doing this amazing uh, personalization of ads. So in memory is in memory is here. So we can wait, we can we can wait, but there's a, there's a lot of in memory capability today. On, on analytic, uh, with analytic engines that is already in use and ready to go. So I, I, gotta, I gotta follow up on the old vendors trying to stuff stuff, stuff into memory. So let's talk <laughs> about some older <laughs> legacy sort of companies. So there's three that come to mind, uh, SAP, Oracle, and, and IBM. IBM's announced Blue Acceleration, and, you know, pushing them in memory. Uh, uh, SAP, HANA, you know, the, the SAP's HANA crazy. And they're really, you know, jamming that down everybody's throat that will, that will listen or even that won't listen. And then you got uh, Oracle responding to SAP saying, hey, we smoke SAP, we got you know, our in-memory edition. Are those three examples? Uh, you know, Vissel Shika would say, uh, Sika would say, you know, a uh, totally new architecture. You hear Hasso Plotner talking about that. You know, certainly the IBM engineers talk about blue acceleration. Uh, are you talking about those types of vendors, different vendors, and, and are, are they sort of overstating their capabilities relative to what the 2.0 guys? Can do. Well, give us some insight. There. I, I think there is some over overstating. I mean, I can give you an example where, um, you know, we were we were in a bake off against uh, Oracle, and they had a, a query that was running 46 hours on their regular database. Um, we put it into our memory optimized platform, and it ran in 30 seconds. So 46 hours down to 30 seconds. Um, had a guy from Oracle stand up in a presentation and, and say, well, we could, you know, if we, we could have brought our consultants in and we could have put it into our in-memory system. And our customer looked at him and said, yeah, you probably could have done that and got it down to about four hours, but we need the 30 seconds. And so it's an example of... So this is a real bake-off example. Yeah, this was a bake-off okay, example. Okay, so, so, uh, so one has to wonder why they didn't bring in their consultants and put it into in-memory and, you know... At, at, a, at a certain point, the customer realized it's not worth it, right? Yeah. So let's go to no, the No, I mean, next, at, the, at the start yeah, of it, right? Yeah. Why wouldn't Oracle do yeah. that? Maybe it wasn't ready. Yeah. You know, it probably wasn't, but okay. So, yeah. so you're talking about... You see, let, me, let me translate what I'm hearing. Your premise is that the old line guys are basically making incremental improvements and and essentially bolting on their their and existing architectures premium. into into in memory <laughs> architectures and charging a premium yeah. uh, and, that's, and 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 Hannah's kind of this new animal but it's it's kind of from an old dog if you will no offense but um uh, and and you're saying that the the new line guys are taking advantage of in memory in different ways natively you know born in memory if yeah. you will Okay, and that's a order of magnitude delta. Yeah, and, and optimized for memory, right? Just even even looking at vector processing and being able to, you know, to look at the registers within the chip and apply the apply the code so that when you compile it, it runs against that and 
and, and then looking at parallelism, every measure of parallelism, right? Parallelism to cores or, or processors or whatever it is, and then taking even node processing and breaking that down further so that this, this concept of parallelization is, is the next generation uh, of being able to fully accelerate everything. So it's, uh, it, so it's, a, it's a new way of approaching I, I, technology. I, I, I want to ask your perspectives on something. So a lot of times when we talk about, we love talking 1.0 and 2.0 in and, and, and this world because it sort of helps us mentally put you know, things in a box. Um, oftentimes, 1.0 is a, is a pejorative and the companies that are associated with 1.0 end up being you know, losers and the 2.0s are the winners. You know, you think Friendster versus okay. Facebook, right? Okay, but it looks like the purveyors of 1.0 Hadoop are making the transition to, to yeah. 2.0. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement. I think the, um, there, there's, a, there's a couple of approaches there, too. So I, was, I heard a hallway conversation uh, here at Strata. I was walking by and, and one engineer said to another engineer, it seems like we're, we're creating databases all over again from scratch. And I thought, wow, well, yeah, that's, that's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> and it, because, so there's a couple approaches. One is to have this, this great Hadoop technology and realize that you need SQL access to it. So you, you design and build a brand new database and you put it on the HDF clus HDFS cluster. Well, I mean, having done this a couple of times now, um, it takes about 80 to $100 million in about four or five years to bring, a to bring a real relational database to market and to have it mature and hardened and ready to go to market. And so one approach would be take that, take that technology and build a new database to sit on it. The other would be take a very mature analytic database, a columnar MPP database, all right, and, and re-architect that to work right on the HDFS cluster. And I think that there's a, there's a maturity advantage that you get there in, in bringing those two technologies together. And, and that's the track that we're looking at. How do we, how do we get our, our analytic platform closer and closer to the HDFS cluster? We're doing it already with the, you know, with the concept that I described, you know, with the data preparation and machine learning where it runs on the HDF cluster. Um, the next phase is going to be to, to figure out how, to, how does the database run right where the data lives on Hadoop. So uh, one last you know, sort of challenge question to Actian. So you guys, I mean, by the very nature of this discussion, uh, the inference is that Actian is 2.0, of course, right? Yeah. You get a thought leader here talking about 1.0 and 2.0 associated with Actian. You guys made some acquisitions, ParXL, uh, Pervasive, you know, VectorDB, uh, and you're bringing those together. Um, what makes Actian 2.0? So I think uh, what makes Actian 2.0 is the fact that it, all of the technologies that we're bringing together into the Actian Analytics platform are next generation technologies. They're, they're optimized, they're fully parallelized, um, world class optimization on every component within the platform to get increased performance. Um, the fact that we're, that all of the products and the entire platform is architected to abstract away the complexity and make it simpler for people to interact with analytics and data. Um, and it's all highly performant. I mean, everything that we do, I mean, I, I, I work with the engineers uh, in Campbell here, and when I'm in there, I, I, every time I look at them, they're finding one more way to optimize it. They're like the, um, they're like supply chain optimization analysts from a, from a UPS or a FedEx, and they're looking at, from the point when the data comes into the system to the point when it, the result spits out, they're looking at every little movement of that data and how can I make it faster? And, and they're excited when their little piece of that, that you know, data supply chain suddenly gets faster and that's their job is to make that piece even faster. So it's, it's fascinating. It's really a Okay, a John, I want to give you the final word as we come to the end of the segment. Uh, summarize for the folks watching, what's it, what's it all about? this year at Big Data Silicon Valley, Big Data SV with the Strata Commerce going on, all the innovation. Summarize for the folks out there, what's it all about this year? Uh, I, I think it's about driving value out of, out, out of the investments that have been made. There's a lot of money that has been spent to date. And everybody that I'm talking to is very concerned about finding a way to quickly get to value. How do I, how do I not only figure out what I have in the data, but how do I move that into operational systems where it's going to create value for my business? And that is the big push. I uh, heard a statistic from one of the analyst firms that said that 
60% of everybody who is implementing big data today is still trying to figure out what the business case is. So they made the investments, they need quick time to value. And my perspective is that that's how we, that's how we built our platform to help people get to value more quickly. Getting to value more quickly. This is theCUBE. We're all about value fast, getting the data to you, extracting the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest. Getting down to end of day two here at uh, Big Data SV. Be right back.